Good morning and welcome to Fitzroy Online for another Sunday. Uh, we welcome you if you're a Fitzroy member, we welcome you if you're an associate member from around the world and thank you for some of your uh, messages this week to tell us where you're listening from. We really appreciate uh, the connection with you and we are continuing to look at that as we go forward. Announcements are all on the website so if you want to check into there you'll find all kinds of things that are happening. Don't forget tonight our Lent uh, journeys travelling uh Narratives through Luke, we'll come to that in the sermon a little bit later on, that's at 7 o'clock, goes live at 7 o'clock, you can watch it for the rest of the week. There will be other announcements after uh, the benediction, so please wait for that. If you're a Fitzroy member, family focus has basically shifted to after the benediction. That might be an idea for the future, but let's uh, not get ahead of ourselves. We'll also be looking today in our prayers uh, at those who've lost loved ones over this past year. And so look out for that as the service goes on. Let's pray before we begin. Lord, we pray that in this time of worship in our own homes, as we try to gather as community alone together, we pray, Lord, that you would come and inspire us, comfort us, challenge us, maybe even correct us, Fill us with your grace and imagination in what we do in our worship and our prayers are reflecting on your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
As a pastor throughout the year, um, I have been thinking a lot about those of you who've lost loved ones during coronavirus times. And I've been thinking for the last little while of doing a section in the service that concentrates prayer and reflection around that. And so we're coming to that today. I'm going to read a short verse from Hebrews 4. I'm going to pray. Um, and then we're going to have a video song that uh, I wrote the lyrics to around this thought of what the grieving are going through during coronavirus times. And then we'll have a worship song coming out of that. I want to thank Garth Black and Eleanor for the co-write of the song, Garth's video, Eleanor's voice, Garth's playing. You will see that in a moment or two. So I want to think of all of us, and you will be thinking of loved ones outside Fitzroy, as I do, who've also lost loved ones during this time. Let's bring everyone who has been lost uh, during this last year to God in prayer. Let us pray together. I want to read first from Hebrews chapter 4. I read these all the time at times of people's passing away or funerals. Wonderful verses of reminder. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are, yet is without sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us approach that throne of grace with confidence. Lord God, going through tough times has been even tougher in this tough year of coronavirus. It is as if there has been an extra bitter twist in the already hard to swallow taste. These days have been even more deadly for dying. An extra separation. Lord, you know that this social distancing for our safety is dangerous to the heart. You created us so you know that the heart needs proximity. To touch brows, to hold hands, to whisper, I love you, thank you, goodbye. Lord, we are aware that Jesus invaded every distance, ripped the veil of holy detachment to reach in close to us as human beings, to enter deathly places, to feel the isolation, to experience on the cross unfair separation. So Lord, we thank you that Jesus sympathises, empathises, and understands our loneliness, our grief, and our pain. We thank you that Jesus weeps with us. We thank you that nothing that we have gone through in COVID-19 days can separate us from him and you and your love. Lord, this morning we remember everyone who has lost loved ones in the past year. Lord, in these days of hellish distance, may everyone who mourns know that you were as near to their loved one, closer than any of us could ever be. Pour out your assurance and comfort and consolation. Be close to those who mourn as they travel on. Bless them. And Lord, teach them to be gentle with their hearts. Not to deny their grief but to defiantly fix their eyes on you. Lord, may they become reliant on you. May they find hope. May they know your care and repair of their broken hearts. Lord, in these tough days, in a tough year, may all who mourn approach your throne of grace with confidence, 
so that they may receive mercy and find grace to help them in their time of need. Amen.
The reading is from John chapter 12. Jesus predicts his death. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who lives their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? 
Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Sunday night during Lent, in Fitzroy, we have been doing the travel narratives in Luke, and we have been reading passages in uh, Luke 9 to 19 where Jesus is focusing his attention on Jerusalem. Uh, I think the cross, the resurrection, and the ascension all in one is what he's looking at, and he is teaching the disciples on the journey there. And I say all of that because it seems that today's reading in the lectionary is perhaps closest to those travel narratives. These are John's travel narratives, if there are such a thing. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And I'm going to try and link um, this week's lectionary reading with last week's travel narrative, where uh, Ruth and James Flood, two members of our congregation, brought that alive and there was another a couple of verses in that reading last week that really challenged me as the pastor of Fitzroy as to where we might go forward so there might be a few ideas at the end of this. I think first of all to just show that uh, these readings in John 12 um, have, have been on a theme. There's Greeks appear and they want to see Jesus and that shouldn't surprise us because as early as chapter 1, that was the way come and see was how Andrew um, talked to his friends about come to see Jesus. And then, of course, Philip um, uh, wanted Nathaniel to see Jesus and uh, he resists uh, the argument and instead invites Nathaniel to come and see. And then in chapter 4, we have another incident where the Samaritan woman, uh, after her near-conversion experience, goes back into a town and asks them to come and see this Jesus that she's met. Come and see, it's it's an evangelistic kind of thing, and it's right here in John 12. And we are going to see something about Jesus that the disciples are maybe not going to be very happy with in a moment or two. The other thing that's there that um, uh, in what Thomas read to us earlier uh, is that the hour has come. Uh, we heard that in, in chapter 2 where Jesus is at the wedding uh, in Cana of Galilee and uh, his, his mum asks him to do a miracle and he says, my hour has not yet come. And then in chapter 7 he says it again, my time is not yet here. But here in John chapter 12 his time has come and that's going to change something about the seeing of the disciples at this stage. The Greeks have appeared in the scene here and they're the ones who want to see Jesus. Now, I've gone into that this week and they could be uh, Jewish Greeks, they could be um, uh, they could be Gentile Greeks. There's some discussion and debate about which one of those there are. I, I suppose in my own thinking, I was imagining that John in his, uh, his account of Jesus' life is trying to tell us that this is a cosmic thing, that this is a world thing. And the Greeks appearing here uh, might actually be part of his opening out uh, the light of uh, the people of God is going to go out from the Jewish people to the wider world. That might be here. But there may be another thing that, that, that the Greeks trigger. And that might be that the time has come because suddenly there's a world dimension to what Jesus is trying to do. All of that could be discussed if I wasn't online and had a bit more time. But I want to not miss the challenge that I think is here for us and uh, in Luke chapter 14 that we looked at in Fitzroy last week. I don't want to lose the challenge in the hermeneutics or the exposition. What I want to do is 
get us into the mood of the disciples in chapter 12. Because it seems to me that there's a, a real mood shift that happens here. Um, they're, they're going back through Bethany and Lazarus, Mary and Martha. They are probably fan club secretary, treasurer and chairman. And so uh, the disciples are with Jesus and there is great celebration, party, friendship. This is a time of euphoria. Jesus' supporters are all around. They've seen what he did to Lazarus. They really believe that he's something special and he's going into Jerusalem. And there's this sort of moment of um, popularity peak for Jesus at this point. And you, you can imagine the disciples are swaggering around this. The disciples are really quite delighted to be, it's like um, uh, walking into Belfast with some kind of pop star. I remember um, I had John Smith, uh, American biker preacher, uh, sadly passed away a few years ago, um, was staying with us in Dublin when I was living in Dublin. And um, we, uh, we uh, Janice was down for the week as well, probably because John Smith was there. And we were taking John around between different events that I'd organised. And um, uh, we took him in the middle of this. His friends of Bono and the Edge. So we had to take him to the opening of the kitchen, which was the U2 um, sort of, uh, it was their club that they'd opened in the Clarence Hotel, in the bottom of the Clarence Hotel, if I remember rightly, in Dublin City Centre. And I remember driving John into uh, the event where he had these special tickets to get in. It was all pop stars and celebrities. And I remember driving down towards the venue and the crowds around about and John got out of my car and just being with John and John getting out of the car with the tickets, the crowd were watching the car. They were watching us. We were with the stars. And it was a lovely feeling about it as we... Uh, drove wherever we drove before we had to come back and uh, get John again at the end of the the, the night. Um, so that's probably what the disciples are feeling. They're in the sense of euphoria and they come and they say, look, these Greeks want to see you. Everybody wants to see you, Jesus. You're, you're the pop star of the day. And then Jesus dampens their enthusiasm. Jesus shows them, come and see, we want to see Jesus Jesus shows them something more about who he is and what he's going to do. So they've come and they've told him that the Greeks are now wanting to see him. And how does Jesus respond? Truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Oh, there's a bit of a bring him back down to earth. There's no heartache like the heartache that when you're in a euphoric moment, you're suddenly dragged into the darkest of moments. The euphoria of having the crowds singing about Jesus, celebrating Jesus, worshipping Jesus, and then suddenly you're told this is going to be about death. This is not going to be about celebrity. This is going to be about humility. I think that's something of the spiritual trauma that the disciples must have gone through at this point. That Jesus is going to be exalted, but they're realising that they're going to have to see death and injustice before they see life and resurrection. They're going to have to look upon their saviour being crucified before they're going to see resurrection a new birth and that kind of victory and we're back to a Jesus who is not the norm we're back to the upside down Jesus we're back to the Jesus that I keep talking about being the God of the manger the donkey the towel and the cross Jesus not wanting the glory well at least not the earthly glory Wanting the glory that really counts, which is doing the will of God the Father and giving himself as a seed that will go into the ground and die before it produces seeds that, yes, even the Greeks will hear about it. 
And then that side word to all of us, anyone who loves their life will lose it, but whoever hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. We've got to let something within us die. We've got to find that same servant humility of the God, of the manger, of the donkey, of the towel and the cross. And that's what took me back to what James and Ruth were talking about last Sunday night in the travel narrative side of Luke. Uh, Humility, that was the overriding thing. I loved the way that Ruth described or defined humility. Not to think less of oneself. We are still heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus. We are still the children of the God who created the universe. We are still created in his image and redeemed by his death. But we've got to think of oneself less. Not to think less of oneself, but to think of oneself less is how Ruth found that definition. We've got to realise that it's not about us. As Jesus realised it wasn't about him. We've got to realise that this is about us serving others in humility. And then I love the way um, James took that into our prayers. And I loved the way that he, he went on the below deck, whatever that program is. Sorry, James, I haven't watched it since. You haven't really enticed me to the program. But you really did speak into my life and the humility to say sorry, the generosity towards other people to heal relationships and not reacting to irritations. There's something deep in my DNA from the Stockman Kernican family tree that reacts quickly to irritations and it is the one thing in my life I wish I could rip out and you spoke right into it on Sunday night because the humility of Christ should be the very thing that rips that out. Humility is not just a definition not to think less of oneself but to think of oneself less But then James made it so pragmatic in COVID lockdown in the intensity of our relationships and our Zoom connections and all of that humility, generosity and not reacting when we're tired and weary and things irritate us. That wasn't the powerful thing for me even though that is just so much already. There was a verse in that reading from our Luke Travel Narratives that really struck me as a minister of Fitzroy. Verse 12, Luke chapter 14. Then Jesus said to his host, then Jesus said to Fitzroy almost, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or your sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbours. If you do, they might invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And I was into thinking about Fitzroy meals. I was into thinking about Fitzroy coffee mornings. I was into three things and I'm not I'm gonna go there second, but I'm gonna go back a while. One of the prayer meetings recently we were praying for the homeless in our community. And I think it was David McNeil prayed a wonderful prayer, a really moving prayer that really touched my heart. And then he said, tonight, Lord, we pray that there would be an angel of yours that would reach every homeless person in Belfast. And I immediately had this image in my head. Wow, what if that could happen? What if there was somebody who could reach to every homeless person in Belfast? How many of them are there? Are there a couple of hundred of them? Maybe a couple of hundred angels might appear beside every homeless person in Belfast. And then I thought, there's a couple of hundred of us. What if it wasn't just Natalie or Janet? What if it was all of us going on the streets to the homeless? Maybe David's prayer can be answered by our own congregation. I was thinking that last Sunday night in the travel narratives. And then I was thinking this. Don't invite your friends or your neighbours or all those to your luncheon. But invite the crippled, the lame and the outcast and the blind. Our lunches in the Alexander Hall. Could we not at least do one lunch a year 
where we invite those that we're ministering to during this coronavirus time in our neighbourhood, where we can invite those from Women's Refuge, where we can invite the homeless off the street, and where we would supply them with a meal. Four Corners has been doing that for quite a time. We took the homeless into the banqueting house of the City Hall in order that the churches might give them a banquet. What if one of our lunches every year was that? And then in general... In this time of no connection, there have been lots of options for connection within Fitzroy, whether it's the women's group, the prayer meeting, whether it's been the compass night we've had recently or the quiz. And what I've noticed is that not everybody's rushing to those connections. And I wonder whether even in Fitzroy, we want to connect with our friends, with the ones that are easy to connect with, the ones that we connect with easiest, most comfortably. And then there's others... They might bore us or they might not be the kind of people we want to hang out with. That's not what we're hearing in these chapters. If you want to to find your life, you've got to lose it. If you want to have a banquet, don't invite the obvious. There's challenges for us here. This humility of Jesus, the God of the manger, the donkey, the towel and the cross... The one who has to go into the earth and die before anything can grow. The one who wasn't as happy as the disciples were at all the celebrity status around Bethany, but was telling them, listen, you're going to have to look at me on a cross and see all the injustice and the suffering of the world before you're going to see life and resurrection and ascension. Humility. Not just a theory. It's not just a few Bible verses. But it needs to start lodging in the decisions of who we reach out to and hang out with and invite for meals or connect with. Over these last number of years I've tried to drop in phrases where those that are stumbling and tumbling after Jesus, I'm delighted that the travel narratives seem to mention that every week. Or that we're particles of light across the city. Or don't forget we're 1010, life in all its fullness. And one of the others is this God of the manger, the donkey, the towel and the cross. Because if we could get that image of Jesus' humility into our decision making, it wouldn't only change us, but it would change the people we invite. It would change change the connections that we make. Humility. Not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less than the ones that Jesus would have us serve. strong.
Thank you again for watching Fitzroy Online. We hope that somewhere in the midst of that service you felt the whisper of the Spirit, the touch of God's love and compassion, maybe inspiration and imagination. If you listen after the benediction, you might have announcements and there may be a few funnies from the tacky team. As a result of what we did in the service, remembering those who've lost loved ones, etc., I thought rather than us do a communal prayer of benediction this morning that I would pray a benediction I use often that might uh, be meaningful to all of us whatever we're going through in these days let me pray a blessing a benediction over each one of you we pray that God you would give us faith to believe the truth and the right at times to ask why God give us joy in life's fulfilment And the right at times to cry. God, we pray that you would give us the strength to carry one another. And the right at times to be the one who wilts. God, give us your grace towards your holiness. And the right at times to confess our guilt. Father God, we pray that you would show us a bigger picture of life. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would put grace notes into our song. Holy Spirit, put on us a road that's deeper, wider and more eternal than the one we've been on. Amen. Amen. Hi, Anne McMurray here, inviting you to Compass Conversations on Wednesday night. It's on Zoom. If you want to take a photograph of the connection, Uh, We're looking this time to the future and where we want to go and what the new different might look like. 7.30 to 8.30 this Wednesday evening. Hope to see you there. Yeah.